1 Samuel chapter 10, while I'm trying to straighten up and stand upright, you can uh, turn there and also uh, let's, let's uh, take just a minute just to, just to testify of God's goodness in our lives this evening. So if you'd like to share about just something that God's done or that God's doing, it's sometimes a good reminder to testify because uh, when, when someone expresses something that God's done or is doing, in their life, it's a reminder that God's also doing something in my life as well. And we can be an encouragement one to another as well. And I think we can also lift up uh, lift up our Savior in a way that He deserves. So anybody you want to share anything? Yes, Angel? Six years ago yesterday, we found out we were pregnant with Savannah. I found out we were having a girl and found out about her heart um, condition. And it's, God's been very good to us and very gracious and very kind. And she's a little miracle. Yeah. Um, Amen. Great. Look at her nodding, yes. <laughs> yeah, she knows it. Okay. Amen. John? Well, your lessons in the Gospel of John have kind of inspired me to write a tract. I'm going to call it the Gospel of John. The Gospel according to John. Yeah. <laughs> no, but really, I think uh, it, we need a tract like that just to, uh, yeah. you know, just maybe starting with John chapter 1 and take a couple of verses there, show that Jesus is God, and uh, you know, just lead people very simply to the Savior. We can get it printed if you put it together. Okay. So, we'll do. Yeah. That'd be great. Amen. You know, uh, I love my preaching. <laughs> well, we do too. I really do. I mean, I just love preaching the Bible. And uh, I, I joke about I love my preaching. I'd say, people ask, you know, if any, anybody ever has anything kind to say about my preaching, I'm always reminded uh, that when you preach the Bible, it's good. Amen. It doesn't matter who it is. It's just good. God's Word. Well, don't good. break your arm. Yeah. <laughs> Brother, I wouldn't even try. <laughs> that's, too, that's too much of a stretch. So I can't swat a mosquito on my face, Joel. Well, this is something that happened years ago that I reminded of. I remember praying for a person I hadn't seen for weeks and weeks and months and months. And then I prayed, like on a Tuesday or Wednesday, and he showed up to a Friday night Bible study the following, like three days later, and shows up the first time in weeks and weeks and months. And months. Uh, isn't that something? And I, I know that happened years ago. That happened in 1988. <laughs> Just a reminder that you have to do that now. Amen. Thank you, Joel. Put your hand up, Melissa. <laughs> uh, I have two. One, it's been a real encouragement to the, the children here. Just today alone, I have two different ones. One mom called to tell me what they're reading in the Bible. And then another one had shown me something that he'd drawn this week. And it was pictures of the crosses and hearts on it. So said that God is great in all ways. Or Something to that effect, which is that he on his own free time is at home thinking about and drawing about God and home that he doesn't get anything about God. Mm -hmm. So, and that was all this morning, just the two, two of the ones. And then a big praise for a lady in Miami Beach that was not from door to door, and a um, Muslim lady, and just the way that for a while that looked like she was going to go back to the Muslim religion. She's gotten into cross and things like that. But she was at that point of, okay, well, God's not doing what I wanted to do, so I'm just going to be Muslim. Anyway, now she's actually just God's been working and working and working on her, and she sees that there's nothing in the Muslim religion or the Catholic religion. And she's so close to being saved. And it's just great that, that he's been working on her, and he has just over and over and over. She just has to accept him as God, as Jesus as God. And she will be saved soon, I believe. So thank God that he keeps going after, after people to be saved. Amen. <clears throat> Charlie, is that your hand? Yeah. I'm okay. Just, I'm just thankful in my dad's home. He uh, is. I mean, obviously he's not healed yet, and he's not safe, but just how the Lord's working there. You know. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll be back. Yeah, we'll be back in church in Miami Beach soon. We had a good crowd in Miami Beach today. Good, mm -hmm. good bunch of people from our locals, and they all came on the same day. And usually it's like one comes this day, it's like they all call each other and say, you know, I'm coming, so why don't you show up or something. But uh, some of them met each other today, which is interesting. People have been coming a long time, got to meet each other. And uh, uh, they, they was, it was just a, a real blessed service down there today. Uh, the day I was ordained into the ministry, uh, Dr. Richard Shermhorn was one of the preachers on my ordination, and he preached the charge from Hebrews chapter 13. 
and he preached a charge to the church. So there's a charge to the church, and there's the charge to the pastor. So I remember Brother uh, brother Stewart, Pastor Stewart from up at West Florida Baptist in Milton, Florida, preached uh, on preaching with prayer, power, and preparation. It was his message for the charge to the preacher. And then the charge to the church was one that Dr. Shermhorn preached. And he preached... Uh, Verse 17 of Hebrews 13, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. And uh, <clears throat> the message was really to the church and saying, you know, your pastor will pastor one of two ways. He will pastor with joy, or he will pastor with grief. And you'll make that determination. He actually won't. Uh, the pastor can't make people respond the way that they ought to. Now, I think that we provoke people to good or to bad in the way that we treat them. I found that to be very true. I can start things off in a rough way, and then people come back at me the way I came at them. Uh, but ultimately, our church determines whether our pastor pastors with joy or with grief. I was ordained in 2001, so that would be uh, 18 years, it will be 19 or 18 years here in November that I've been an ordained preacher. And I've had 18 years of joy. And I just am overwhelmed about that when I, every time I think about it. You know, I remember the charge and thinking, you know, I might have a joy ministry, I might have a grief ministry. And grief can come, and grievous days certainly are there. But God's just given me a ministry of joy. And I'm just so thankful for that. Just think about this morning and uh, just the people that are here and that were here this morning, a lot of people that were out of town this morning as well. But just think about how great it was to have each person that was here this morning and how much I miss the people that weren't here and how privileged I am to just be around such marvelous people, just wonderful people. And it really is, it's, it's just, it's just something I'm thankful for. And that God's just been really good to us. We've got a really, really uh, wonderful ministry here in Fort Lauderdale. God has just given us a wonderful, wonderful church. It's just really great to be part of this body and to be around the eclectic group of members that God's brought together. I think it's wonderful. Anyone else want to share before we get to Scripture? Okay. First Samuel and chapter chapter ten. <clears throat> I'm read verses uh, 1 down to 6. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head, this is, this is Saul, of course, and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? And when they departed from, when thou art departed from me today, thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulchre in the border of Benjamin at Zelrazah, and they will say unto thee, the asses which thou wentest to seek are found, and though thy father hath left the care of the asses, and sorrow for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shall meet thee three men going up to the god of Bethel, one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they'll salute thee, and give thee two loaves of bread, <coughs> which thou shalt receive of their hands. After that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines? And it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tavern, a pipe and a harp before them. And they shall prophesy. Let's read verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. Father, please, please help us as we look at the life and the example of Saul to remember that decisions and choices that we make determine our consequences and the outcome of our lives. And <clears throat> even while we determine these things, help us to see the hand of God in individual lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have been seeing the last couple of weeks that people change. Last week we saw that people sometimes change for the bad. You know, in the Christian life, we tend to allow only for a change for the better, don't we? We only allow for people to change to go the right direction. Experience has taught me that when people get out of fellowship with the Lord, they also change for the worse. 
They go away from God, they go away from sound doctrine, they go away from serving, and they go to a place of oftentimes bitterness or even getting in the way of the Lord's work. And I've seen that happen with people. And many uh, believers wrestle with that so much so that they I wonder, could a person change for the worse? Is that an evidence when somebody goes that direction that they were never saved? The reality of it is that the word apostasy means going away from the truth. Apostasia. And uh, the word going away from the truth implies that one begins, or the starting point is truth. Uh, I think that we can agree on some things in that discussion. I think we can agree because a person uh, embraces uh, false doctrine or, or a system of theology uh, that isn't wholly biblical, that does not necessarily mean that they're unsaved. Couldn't we, we agree with that? Could a person be Presbyterian and be born again? I think so. Could many people, uh, could we assume that in a good Presbyterian church, I'm not sure how you, you would set the parameters for identifying that. That almost sounds ironic to me a little bit, but can we, can we say that in a good Presbyterian church, a lot of the people are saved. Mm -hmm. uh, many people are saved, but does the Presbyterian church not preach Calvinism? And is that not a damnable heresy? And the answer is, indeed it is. So, um, <clears throat> how does a person become a Calvinist? You ever met somebody who got saved and then later on became a Calvinist? I, many, many for me. Whitfield uh, was a Calvinist. Kind of, yes, yes, he was, yeah, yes. Uh, and the answer to, to, to that question is, is that uh, well, there are a lot of answers to the question. It's a bad system of theology. It's when you begin to follow the theology of man instead of the Word of God. Ultimately, is what it comes down to. Uh, but the question is, does any person ever get saved by the doctrine of Calvinism? Does the doctrine of Calvinism ever save it? Anyone? Nobody ever gets struck by the Lord into salvation. I'm uh, using a little bit of sarcasm talking about uh, Saul, who says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the gospel which he received was that Jesus died for our sin, was buried, and rose again. And he received that gospel. He wasn't forced into conversion. I've, I've heard Saul many times referred to as an individual who was forced into conversion. Well, how's a person become a Calvinist? Well, it's, it's how you respond to the Word of God, actually. If the Word of God is less an authority than, uh, than men, and, that, I, and I'm not bashing here, that's really the reality, the confession, the Westminster Confession, becomes a greater authority than the Word of God, or it becomes the source through which the Word of God is interpreted. Or perhaps a leader, uh, uh, a uh, religious leader. For instance, in our, in our time period, in our day and age, I have seen countless individuals become Calvinists by following... John Piper. I've seen a lot of people become Calvinists by following R.C. Sproul. And they become Calvinists by following leaders. And again, they put a leader in a position of greater authority than the Word of God. And we could say that those individuals we could are probably, for the most part, uh, if they were ever saved, they're still saved, right? So, allowing that they're saved to begin with, and we don't know anything more than what a man can tell us. A person who's born again, even when he embraces false theology, is still saved the way that he got saved. My point in saying all that is that people change for the worse. Nobody ever becomes a better Christian by becoming a Calvinist. Nobody ever becomes a better Christian by uh, getting into free will theology, where you believe you can lose your salvation. You're not more effective for the cause of Christ or the gospel because of those things. Uh, people change for the worst theologically. Other Christians, uh, what we call backslide. They get out of fellowship with God. Sometimes they get bitter over an event. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Oftentimes I've seen individuals want a relationship that violates 1 Corinthians chapter 6 when we're told not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And I've seen individuals try to quantify that by converting the person that they want to be in a relationship with. And a person being saved doesn't mean that you're equally yoked. Believers can be unequally yoked one with another as well. And unbelief is more than just uh, for a lost individual. But oftentimes when things don't work out, then the <coughs> subsequent bitterness of the person, instead of responding and just saying, oh, I was wrong and God's always right, and it's like, well, God, you were wrong about this. And when you believe that God uh, does evil or God has wronged you, you become bitter. And I've seen believers go into that place and go into a place where... Uh, they are in rebellion against God and are in, in terrible sin. It happens. It happens. So people change for the worse. 
It's important for us as believers to realize that because if you misdiagnose something, you can't help with the, with the solution for it. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, here's a for instance. If a person's living in sin, their need is not the gospel. If a saved person, I should say, is living in sin, their need is not the gospel. And oftentimes, because we don't know how to deal with things, we just say, well, they're probably not saved, and we try to apply the wrong medicine, the wrong solution to the problem. Instead of trying to help them uh, theologically, if they, if they believe something wrong about God, instead of trying to win them and uh, save them either uh, by, either by compassion or by fear, uh, we try to convert them, and that's frustrating if you're saved. I remember being a teenager and having adults go after young people who had sin in their lives and try to get them saved and drove them away from God. Drove them away from God. I watched it happen with some of my friends by a wrong response and this bad theology. So it's important for us as believers to be thinkers as well. And Saul is an individual that is a good case study for an individual who... Uh, was good and went bad. We saw last week, uh, we saw that, first of all, God told Saul that had he responded the right way, that he would have established his throne forever, his kingdom forever. He'd have been the David. All the things that we talk about, the Davidic throne and the line of David and the seed of David and the son of David, all those promises would have been for Saul. And so we're going to look this evening briefly at the progression of how God prepared Saul for what could have been, but was not because of how Saul responded to God. So we read verse 6. Let's go back there to chapter 10. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs are coming to thee, <clears throat> that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And so, go to verse 9. It was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. Did you see that? It was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. I just want to look at that statement there. and uh, The statement, God gave him another heart. I ask the question, what might have been had Saul been what God gave him? And we'll ask the other question. And, and the uh, theoretical question is really not theoretical. The answer may be easily known. What kind of a heart would God have given to Saul? What kind of a heart would it have been God would have given to Saul? A bitter heart? An angry heart? Obedient. A rebellious heart? Okay, so an obedient heart. I think that would, that would be a descriptive word for it, perhaps. What else? A brave heart. Okay, a courageous heart. Yeah. Uh, is this before or after he hides in the basket? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? The hiding in the basket had nothing to do with rising to the occasion, did it? I mean, the reality of it is, is the hiding in the basket was Saul not trying to... Well, it was him trying to avoid being king of Israel. But, you know, I think, I think it's just a response to being overwhelmed, right? How do you respond uh, to the accolades of men when only God is supposed to have the glory? I mean, I, that's how I see that. Saul hid because he thought, well, you know what? You know, God's supposed to be the king of Israel, not me. Uh, I would say a humble heart, wouldn't you? Certainly you could say a humble heart, wouldn't you? I think that would be good. Brother John said a brave heart, and, and uh, unfortunately you're getting ahead of me, brother. That's kind of where we're going to... Uh, end up coming to um, the scripture says in verse um, 14 Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant uh, <clears throat> whither went she and he said to seek the asses and when we saw that they, they were nowhere we came to Samuel and, Samuel and Saul's uncle said tell me I pray thee what Samuel said unto thee unto you and Saul said unto his uncle he told us plainly that the asses were found but of the matter of the kingdom whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. <laughs> uh, we certainly could say Saul had a humble heart. Uh, how do you tell people, particularly family, when Jesus said that a prophet has no honor in his own country, 
I'm the new king. I think of some instances where individuals that God had told that to shared and the response. And the first person I think of is probably the same one you're thinking of, and that's Joseph. Remember Joseph? Yeah, you know, all the stars bowed to my star. All the sheaves bowed to my sheep. And the, you know, the, so, you know, clearly, and, and Jacob, Jacob was kind of like Joseph. It's a little over the top when you think that not only your brothers and sisters, but myself and your mother are going to bow to you. And so how do you say something like, yes, I'm <coughs> the king of our nation, and you're going to be hearing about me in the news pretty soon. And Saul just didn't say anything at all. What did he tell you? Well, he told me plainly that the asses were found. He didn't say anything else. Um, there's something about some modesty, isn't there? There's something about the uh, ability to not have to tell. Are you one of the people that have a hard time keeping it to yourself? And, uh, well, I'll tell you something. Sometimes it's just hard. Man, I know something you don't know. I know something you know. It's just a, um, we, I have, I had family members that have a very, very difficult time not telling anything. My grandma is where it comes from. My grandma is one of those people that has a pretty hard time keeping a secret. I remember one time we had a 40th anniversary for my parents. And Melissa and I drove all the way, got out of camp one day and drove overnight to be there the next morning and my sister put on this big anniversary party in my grandma's house and my grandma knew we were coming and saw my mom and dad the day before and didn't breathe a word of it and we just couldn't believe it and my poor sister uh, she uh, she just had the most difficult time to know something uh, so and so called told me a secret oh you better keep it then well aren't you curious what it was no not really uh, that was my my poor sister Melissa used to send my uh, brother-in-law gifts and write for Jenny or to for Eric, Jenny, do not open, do not look, whatever. And she write messages like send gifts, Christmas gifts to Eric. To my sister was like the notorious peeker, you know, open the package and look to see. It was sort of like Angela. Angela does the same thing. Uh, but uh, do you do that, Angela? Yeah. Yes, you do. Yes, no, I can tell. That's yeah. So. Uh, it's pretty tough, but Saul is just one of those guys that, well, you know, I've been a trusted king of Israel. He sure had a lot to think about. But I think that one of the reasons he responded the way that he did is because God had given him a new heart. In other words, God had given him the heart of a king. And, you know, it just isn't noble, is it? Isn't, isn't royalty to go around blabbing everything? We know Saul did change in the future, didn't he? But we're looking at Saul in the days when he's exactly what God wanted him to be for king. And so, um, look at verse 26. Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts <coughs> God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents. And I like the next phrase. Let's read it together. But he held his peace. So guys responded wrong to Saul. And Saul's response was to excoriate them or teach them a lesson. The answer is not at all. His response was to just be silent. And you know, the heart that God had given Saul here is one that really uh, would set an example for us. People will certainly say things about you, particularly when they see you as perceived competition or when they're glory seekers and they think that you have the glory that they want to have. It shouldn't be that way. But in the ministry, even when God has used or put a person in a certain place, or God has done something, we tend to despise something that God has used. Or I should say someone that God has used. And these individuals are certainly envious to say the least, of Saul, and uh, they didn't bring him any presents. You know, that's a little bit. there's a little bit of that in us. Uh, with regard to the prestige and the power from being king, who wouldn't like a little bit of the benefits 
that Saul certainly would one day have. Of course, the responsibilities are the major thing. So, in verse 1 of chapter 11, Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. Well, shame on them, cowards. And Nahash the Ammonite said, answered them, on this condition will I make a covenant with you, <clears throat> that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for reproach upon all Israel. And the elders of Jabesh said unto them, Give us seven days' respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. I don't like these guys. I don't like Nahash, and I don't like the men of Jabesh Gilead. You know, we need a little Charlton Heston here. Uh, if you will. You know, you can take my guns when you pry them from my cold dead fingers, except it's my right eyeball <laughs> instead of my firearm. <laughs> you can take my eyeball when you can pry it from my cold dead face or whatever. <laughs> the reality of it is, is that these guys are cowards. You say, but pastor, you have to put yourselves in their sandals. You know, never judge a man until you've walked a mile in his sandals. Um, I have enough life experience to know that if you play that game all the time, there's just an excuse for cowardice all the time. You know, at some point, you just have to be a man and realize, regardless of the consequences, I'm just going to do the best thing or the right thing. And in no circumstance am I going to do something that dishonors God or God's people. And this would absolutely have dishonored God's people. It would have been a reproach to all of Israel to have their brethren, uh, to have their eyes put out, and to be servants of the very individuals that they should have driven out of the land. And so verse 4, then, the messengers of, then came the messengers of Gibeah of Saul, to Gibeah of Saul, and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field, and Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? Are these people sick? What's wrong? Why are they crying? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh Gilead. And Saul laid down and cried. Crocodile tears. Great tears that flooded the land. No? Behold, Saul came after the herd. Or I'm sorry, verse 6. And the Spirit of God came about Saul when he heard those tidings. And his anger was kindled greatly. He took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces. And sent them throughout all the coast of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. Saul said, I'll tell you one thing that's more frightening than this Ammonite fellow. Me. <laughs> that's precisely what he did. Nahash the Ammonite said, comes down in camps, and these guys are, oh, Nahash is so frightening, he's so scary. We'll serve you. And he said, under one condition, we get to pop out your right eye. And they said, well, we're going to ask around and see if we can get help, and if nobody will help us, then we'll let you do that. And everybody just starts bawling their eyes out. I mean, literally, ha <laughs> ha, bawling their right eye out. Right? So they're crying, and uh, they're just ready to lay down and say, oh, we're so sorry for you guys. This are, this is, these are the be warm and be clothed people here. The, you know, notwithstanding, you know, now be warm. Oh, guys, that's going to be terrible when you have your eyes put out. Oh, that, that just makes me cry thinking about it. And Saul said, I'm not going to cry a tear about that. It makes me mad thinking about you guys crying about something that you ought to do something about. And I'm going to tell you, so bring them oxen over here. And he grabbed the oxen and he whacked them up. Now, after he was so careful with his father's donkeys, you'd think he'd have more regard for the oxen, but no, sir. He was so mad, he whacked up the oxen, and he sent them out. Everybody, this happened in the judges, too. Remember this? But he sent them out, and he said, everybody, take a look at what I did to this, and just remind yourself, just remember, that if you don't show up to fight, I'm going to show up and do this to you. And I said, man, Saul's a mean guy. It's going to whack us up. My eye popped out. <laughs> and so what do they do? They come after him, and we know the, the consequence of Saul's leadership. What was the consequence of Saul's leadership? 
Well, they have great victory, right? They uh, take care of the matter, and the fellows down in Jabez Gilead, little cowards, get to keep their eyeballs, and everything goes goes pretty well. And <clears throat> um, now we'll go down to uh, verse 12. Uh, and the people said to Samuel, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. And Saul said, There shall not a man be put to death this day, for today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed <clears throat> sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Now I want to look at verse 12, and that's pretty much as far as we'll go this evening. Now we asked the question at the beginning, what kind of a heart did God give Saul? What kind of a heart did God give Saul? Well, he gave him a certainly a courageous heart, as Brother John said. He just preached my message before I got there <laughs> earlier. Uh, but he did. He, he, became, he became the lone man of courage in Israel. You'd be surprised at how inspiring courage is. Just to look at another believer and politely call him a spineless coward sometimes is just the very thing that they need. Just to say you're a spineless coward. Right's right, wrong's wrong. What will you lose that is more valuable than the testimony of the Lord? God's people. And that's precisely what Saul did. We know a different Saul later, don't we? We know a Saul that you know, was allowing the Philistine to come down and yell, send me a man to fight. If I win, you're going to be my servants. If, if uh, you win, we'll be your servants. And the reality of it is, is that why in the world would one man take on one man like Goliath? Why would you go one-on-one -on -one in that kind of a situation? You know, why not Saul say, you know, if you guys don't come with me, I'm going to whack you up. So you're going to run in front of me, and when we get to Goliath, you take the first whack and I'll save you. And I send some guys ahead, scare some people, frighten some people more, make them more afraid, to, make them more afraid to uh, do wrong than to do right. You know, there's an appropriate place for that, isn't there? And that was the kind of man Saul was. He was a courageous man. And then after he had demonstrated such courage, we see mercy. Boy, nothing belongs in a king more than mercy in the heart of a king, is there? There's just nothing more um, more royal in the heart of a king than, than being merciful. And Saul's response was, this is a day of rejoicing. Nobody's going to be put to death today. Uh -uh. I'm, sure, I'm sure he uh, let it be known. I, I know who you are. I know who said what, and I remember you, and you remember Solomon, and kind of gave some rules. Don't you go, don't leave the city. And you leave the city, you're going to be put to death. Deal? Deal. Uh, you know, Joab has to be taken care of. They different things like that. But a good king is a king that also knows when to show mercy. I think the men of Belial became <laughs> men of God afterward. They became Saul converts because of Saul's response to them. And so, the question then is this. And the answer is simple. It's not a trick. When God gives someone a different heart, what then causes them to go to a direction where they change for bad. If God gave, and he did, didn't he? Saul a different heart. Then what caused Saul to change or to go in the wrong direction? Just think of... They rejected him. They rejected him? Well, no, he rejected it. He rejected them. Okay, so, yeah, that's true. And how did he do it? Well, John said there are three kinds of sin, the lust of the 
flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Yes. I believe it was the pride of life. That yes. That holds all there. Yeah. And how was that translated? How did Samuel vocalize that? Not. When thou wast little in thine own sight. You know what's happened to Saul? He forgot how little he was and how big God was. That was only after two years of being king. After two years of being king. He forgot how little he was and how big God was. When Saul hid in the baskets, he was pretty small. That's how he saw himself. I'm just little old Saul. And God had given him the heart that he needed, in spite of that, to do big things. To do great things. Big heart. You gotta say a guy's got a big heart when they respond to the men of Belial the way Saul did. Big heart. Courageous heart, merciful heart. But Saul changed for the bad when he became big. He looked in the mirror and he said, You know, you are seven foot tall. That's big. You are. You're pretty good in a battle. That's big. You do strike a commanding pose and people follow. You're pretty big. And he started seeing the person in the mirror as big. When you see yourself as big, at the very least you see God as being smaller. And when you see God is smaller, you're not afraid to do something like offer Him a sacrifice that you have no right to offer Him. And I believe that the pride of life is one of the ways that men can change. And change for bad, not for good. So Father, please help us this evening to remember this. Remember how little we are. Large and small is always in proportion. But yet, God, when we see You as high and lifted up, we're always small, and I pray that you would help us to see you that way. In Jesus' name, amen. And you're, just, you're dismissed. What? <laughs>